Okay, so uh, today uh, it's our first bites of innovation and actually Martin was going to do the introduction, uh, but I'm happy to welcome um, Dr. Lundgren. So he's an interventional uh, radiologist at Stanford Healthcare. Uh, he's also an associate professor of radiology at Stanford University. And he's co-director of the Stanford Amy Center. Is that correct? Yes. And Dr. Lundgren um, has uh, funded research by the NIH and SF NSF in the field of AI and deep learning in medical imaging, precision medicine, and predictive health outcomes. So today he's going to talk about the day two problem for medical imaging AI. Um, so without further ado, <laughs> let's hear his talk. Great, thank you so much, Alina. I'm gonna share my screen in just a sec here. It's loading. There we go. All right, took a little bit. All right. Here we go. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm delighted to kick off this uh, this sort of webinar series. Um, and thanks again for having me here. So I am Matt Lundgren. I am the co-director of the Amy Center at Stanford. I'm also a practicing radiologist. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, clinical imaging AI translation and what we're sort of terming the day two problem. And, and it'll make more sense as we go through of why we call it that. Um, these are my disclosures. So I think it's not a surprise to this audience, at least if I'm assuming if you're here, you're interested in this topic and you probably know that there's a great deal of investment and excitement around AI and healthcare. Uh, and in particular, uh, there's a large, a thriving ecosystem of, of small and large companies, in addition to academic centers like ours who are developing models, uh, translating them into practice and exploring the applicability in a variety of different ways uh, in, the, in the healthcare environment for, for these machine learning tools. Uh, we've also seen quite a bit of, of, of approvals. Now, this is a, a, an older list, um, which is growing every day for uh, groups that have developed software solutions based on ML or AI uh, and have integrated them in some fashion into a commercial product and, and making those available on the market. Uh, and it's, again, it's getting difficult to even keep up with the number of, of solutions out there. So when folks ask me, you know, where are we then? I mean, are we ready? for this to be just completely taking over our practices, I tell them actually, or I show them this picture, and I said, actually, you're right around there. Um, and, and despite that we've made so much progress, in fact, if you just take a pause and think about what we were doing six, seven years ago, it's astounding to think that we now are, are in the place that we are in. Uh, however, there's a long way to go, um, and there's some critical areas that need to be addressed before we can really get to the place where we need, we need to be clinically. So some of these barriers I think may be familiar to you. So first of all, there's the idea of choice and choice comes down to some, to some extent to governance, right? There's a lot of different models out there. There's a lot of different solutions. There's not really a systematic way to evaluate them, at least for best practices. And in addition, some academic centers like ours have many in-house solutions as well that have been developed. And this kind of puts a burden on the leadership of healthcare systems and all the different stakeholders to decide how do we just, you know, choose which model we're going to use uh, in, in which use case. Then there's the problem of validation, right? Which is kind of, uh, again, a newer area. Where we're sort of looking at how do these models that were developed in other places, how do they perform on our data? How does it work in our practice? Uh, when does it fail? And if there's four or five different solutions, that do the same thing, how do I know which one's best, right? And then finally integration, which you know, has been referred to before as the last mile problem, but it's not only just hooking things up and running them in your system, it's also about trying to understand uh, how do you evaluate them over time? And that's what we're gonna get into. So when it comes to the choice question, it, that again comes down to governance. And I think a lot of groups have decided that best practices uh, going forward are going to involve multidisciplinary teams that have expertise from a variety of, of key areas in order to make the right decisions and review possible solutions uh, that need to be integrated into a given healthcare system. It's not just a informaticist or it's not just a 
clinician or a data scientist. There's a combination of, 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 of skill sets that are necessary. And I think this is becoming uh, fairly commonplace now as we seek to sort of look, how do we navigate this new clinical AI world? And you know, we've even come up with some recommendations for how do you quantify uh, the evaluation? So if there's a couple dozen different AI options for clinical deployment in your, in your healthcare system, are there ways that we can think about comparing and contrasting them based on our different skill sets? And this is just a, a mock-up of an example of the kinds of things that we're doing to make these critical decisions as more and more of these solutions are available to us. And then obviously there's the implementation question, right? Do you have the, the nuts and bolts to plug this into your system uh, and to run it effectively, right? And the part of that um, is a partnership um, at times with different vendors, uh, but for the most part, this is gonna be falling on, uh, on existing IT infrastructure, which isn't necessarily keyed up to run AI solutions. And we're seeing a lot more in the platform space to help address this. And then finally, you know, we understand that we can stepwise, uh, take a stepwise approach to integration, which is part of best practices in any ML ops uh, group. We understand that we need to ensure both pre-deployment validation and then early deployment validation to ensure that these systems will work as advertised. But there's one area that hasn't really been discussed and it ends up being one of the most important. And that's explainable real-time monitoring. So um, what I'm talking about is, you know, we understand from almost every other non-clinical vertical that uh, ML models are different than other software solutions. And we can have a great deal of understanding about their performance in a testing environment and a small validation environment. But we also understand from colleagues in, again, the finance industry, the ads industry, other places that heavily rely on ML uh, solutions that there's a lot of different complicated uh, factors that come up in deployment that we currently don't have the mechanisms for in clinical healthcare to deal with. And what are those things? Well, you know, these are some of the core features that are currently lacking in ongoing evaluation. So if we have a half dozen or more models in production that we've decided are the best and we've deployed them, uh, how are we going to address these other components without overburdening our healthcare systems with regards to constant testing? And that's really the, that's really the critical piece here. And so I love this graphic by evidently.ai because when you go to a healthcare system with a software solution, they do have infrastructure to hook up software and to ensure that it's running and to troubleshoot. But what we recognize from the, again, the ML community is that when we're deploying these solutions, there are some unique components to them that is different than traditional software that we do not have the mechanisms again to really, to really address. And, that, and again, that, this is a critical problem, right? Because once you get to the deployment stage, the timeline at that point is you know, potentially limitless, right? And the scale for the number of patients that could potentially be impacted by this model expands very rapidly. Now there are solutions um, out there that are both open source and commercial. I've listed a few here. There are many, many more. ML ops is not a new concept, right? The idea that we need to monitor, potentially check, retrain, debug systems in production. However, what is unique is that there isn't a version of these things that operates in, in the clinical world and in particular, the medical imaging world, which has unique challenges that have to be addressed by specialists. And so what we've done at Stanford is we've actually started to put together uh, a comprehensive platform that can evaluate model performance. And the critical piece is that it does not need ground truth. So again, unlike other verticals where ground truth is constantly being evaluated almost in real time, we cannot ask our healthcare systems to take time to re-annotate or get feedback for ground truth immediately when we need to know our model's performance. So what we've decided to do is take this into three different steps in, in the medical imaging use case. In the first step, we can sort of look at this as a out of distribution problem, right? We can sort of take in the new input data and look at the DICOM metadata to see if there's a difference in what was expected versus what we're being served. But we can also be more sophisticated using variational autoencoders to do outlier detection, right? And, and the way you do this is you basically uh, have an autoencoder that tries to reconstruct any given input that it receives. And if the input data cannot be reconstructed well based on certain metrics, 
we recognize that reconstruction error is high and that data can be flagged as having drifted or being an outlier. This is critical, right, for imaging data as we have seen in many different use cases as the distribution of disease shifts, as the different equipment up gets upgraded in a healthcare system, models aren't really prepared to generalize immediately to those use cases. Or if they do, we'd like to make sure that they, uh, we have a system that can tell us that things are going well. There's also options for what we're, what we're starting to term black box shift detection, right? So this detects drift or changes in the model's behavior based on the neural network activations. And this uses features extracted from the model's hidden layers uh, to sort of look at, you know, again, the output of the softmax layer to detect the drift. Other hidden layers can be extracted as well. And we can look at those with metrics and compare without labels uh, based on drift, drift experiments. And this is really an exciting area for us because it's going to leverage an opportunity to really track model performance in real time. And then finally, uh, predicted probabilities, right? So just some simple ideas here. When you think about distribution of disease, uh, we just went through a pandemic. If your model was trained pre-COVID, the distribution of disease is going to be vastly different in a healthcare system during the peak of the pandemic. That's a very understandable use case of, of and why we need to have these kinds of tools because without them, we actually don't know what we're doing. We're essentially flying blind. Um, and and that, again, this is, this is a significant problem that we're starting to see crop up in early adopters that have taken these solutions without these protections in place. So what we've, what we've uh, worked to develop is a prediction drift dashboard that allows us to use analyses that do not, again, require ground truth in order to drill down on outliers and, and distribution shifts in real time to decide what happened in a particular use case. Was there a new x-ray machine onboarded? Was there a new technologist using a different protocol? Uh, did the model drift inherently because of the pathology change? Um, these kinds of you know, different sort of use cases actually have come to the forefront and have been really instructive as we've done some research on this in our system. And so what we're going to deliver is a medical imaging AI model, a uh, computational model monitoring platform. Um, we will know real-time performance. We'll be able to debug model decay as it's run in production. But one of the key things here is that we're not going to require ground truth labeling in order to get this information, which is really the key bottleneck and the difficulty in a healthcare environment in using some of the off-the-shelf solutions that are currently available. And then finally, as we see the FDA and other regulatory bodies, head towards opening up models for retraining, uh, potentially even continuous learning in the future, those sorts of things would be impossible without a system like this. So we're really preparing ourselves for the future of where the clinical AI solutions will eventually go. So hoping to have more on this soon. And for all of you listening, we'll hopefully have this available to all of you as an open source solution that you can use in your environments. Uh, appreciate you listening to uh, my discussion today. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions as we uh, start the discussion component. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. I, I'm, I'm very sorry. Just when I was about to start the <laughs> introduction, my internet went completely down. I couldn't even, I could, like my, my Wi-Fi went down, my phone was down. I really didn't know what to do. <laughs> so I hope uh, Aline was able to, uh, to take over a little bit. <laughs> you did great. It was perfect. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, thanks for the presentation, uh, Matt. I only saw the last couple of slides, unfortunately. <laughs> that looked very interesting. Um, so if anybody has a question, feel free to, uh, to put it in the chat. Um, I actually have one question. So now that you are able to uh, real-time, or at least while the uh, algorithms are being implemented or actually already clinically used, how do you see the performance in actual in the clinical setting versus, uh, you know, when I read papers, it's always, oh, we got a great performance of like 0.96% or so. And then I, I feel like in reality, that's probably going to be much worse. What is your experience there? It's definitely true that um, both models that we've even developed on our own data, right, historical data, but certainly commercial solutions that were developed outside of our healthcare environment have differing performance on our pre-deployment validation. So I, I really wanted to emphasize today that we have as a community really, uh, I think, grasped the idea that we need to ensure generalizability to new target data. I think that's very clear and certainly clear to the FDA 
and others before things are approved. And that's, that's, that's part one, or I would call maybe day one. But day two is now what happens next, right? So when you deploy them, you can hook things up. But in your mind, you're sort of expecting that performance will always be at the level that you had in the pre-validation testing. Now, some groups have argued that we need to actually stop or pause production or at least take periods of time data you know, slices over periods of time, re-annotate that with ground truth, and then run those validation tests over time, multiple times, right? And while that may be true, and we may need to do that on a quarterly basis or maybe even an annual basis, depending on the bandwidth of the healthcare system, recognizing that's a significant investment uh, in order to have you know, clinician labor or best practices to really do those validation steps over time. And it's probably infeasible when we think about what the, the costs and the savings of some of these solutions actually might be in, in actual practice. So we're really getting into a place where what we need and what I was hoping to, to sort of get across today is we need a way to monitor you know, constantly streams of information that tell us performance or at least give us leading and lagging indicators that are tied to that ground truth performance without having to have the ground truth at the time of the image you know, being served to the model. And that has been a critical question that we've started to answer by putting together you know, consecutive timelines of data. And I'll tell you that the COVID pandemic has been a terrific use case for us because we can see, we know that there's going to be massive distribution shifts, both in the pathology, but the patients the, themselves, right? The, the ages of the patients, the conditions of the patients are going to change in our healthcare system for a routine chest x-ray, for example. And that has really shown us that we can, in, in fact, look at some of these leading and lagging indicators, both on the input data, the model itself, and then also the output data to give us a sense that this model is drifting or the performance is going to go below what we would ex consider acceptable. And that's the point where we're hoping in the future, we can trigger what would either be a new validation or potentially a retraining depending on the circumstance. So obviously the FDA does not allow that, but models that were developed in house, uh, we don't have those same constraints. So we could potentially pause a model and retrain it and then redeploy, right? So there's options for us. Uh, I think that, that this, sort of, um, this sort of framework really opens up for us. Great, so uh, we have uh, some questions from the audience. Um, so how do you determine the decay in accuracy of the model? And I think it's kind of related, uh, another question from Ryan. If you observe significant drift or decay in model performance over time, how would you go about establishing a root cause, especially without access to ground truth data? Yeah, so we don't necessarily need the ground truth in order to step. So in a lot of cases, what we found uh, in some of our early testing was that as, as many of you who work in the medical imaging space may know, uh, healthcare systems work with using the DICOM metadata to identify a scan or a protocol. And there's a significant amount of error in there. So if I have a model that was meant to, let's just use the example, uh, make diagnoses on adult chest x-rays, and all of a sudden a pediatric chest x-ray because of the DICOM metadata was served to my model, that's an out of distribution question. Those kinds of things are easier to detect. If I'm noticing that there's a sub-segment, uh, maybe a location, for example, I got a new x-ray machine installed from a different vendor at an outpatient imaging center. And those same those images started to be sent to my model. There are, there are opportunities to pick up that difference and then say, there is an obvious common denominator, again, without a ground truth, knowing that that's for coming from a different location, we can drill down into that. Um, other things that we can drill down onto later are things like just the plain prediction percentage. So if, if I know in my training data of my model that it expects to see on average 10 to 15% positive labels for pneumonia, and then all of a sudden it's 50%. I don't need ground truth. I'm just looking at the labels at this point. I can say that there is a difference, right? A significant change from what it's expecting to put out versus what it is. Is that something that is problematic with the model or is there a new pandemic? What is the cause of that? And then as you're suggesting, these leading and lagging indicators along that chain I pointed out, give us an opportunity to then 
more intelligently and data in a data driven way look at what the cause might be and th at that point may require ground truth. We also have talked about using and what we've just started to put together is an opportunity to leverage the NLP systems that we have to get weak labels for ground truth to then feed back into the system so that we have both a kind of a rough estimate of how things are going based on, again, without requiring expert input because we cannot put that burden on our clinicians, but then also combining with those other non-ground truth indicators really give us a nice, uh, nice window in what's happening. Nice. Now, actually, uh, so the next question is a little bit in line with this, I think. So what if we um, we're moving away from these by hand manual annotations? What will the, according to you, will be the uh, impact on the development cycle for algorithms in industry? Do you think it will have any impact there? I don't know if this, a lot of the things that we borrowed here will unlikely, you know, sort of directly relate to that. But what I am seeing as in terms of trends are a, really a strong push towards few shot or just a plain self-supervised learning. I'm sure you've heard some of the luminaries of the field, uh, uh, Jan LeCun for, for, from FAIR, for example, really just saying we need to get to a place where some of these uh, large systems are able to take, and we have a nice advantage in the sense that we have image text pairs where the representations of the pixels and the representations of the sequences of uh, and, and words can be related in a way that doesn't require us as human experts to manually validate um, on, at the same time, you know, for training, I should say. But at the same time, we will ultimately always need some sense of where the human expert performance lies just to have a benchmark. It, it's very difficult to leverage either weak labels as I've seen done, which is problematic for validation, right? You, it, it, you, you kind of carry over that noise and in most cases underestimate the true model's performance, but not having an, an understanding of how this system would interact with your current healthcare environment. And by that, I mean, how do your clinician, however your clinicians currently perform is the only benchmark that matters when you're deploying, right? It doesn't matter if it's the world's experts versus your model, it's your experts versus, because your system has been, uh, the ecosystem is sort of structured around that expectation of calling this versus that, right? In the gray zone of medical imaging. So uh, all that is to say that I see a lot of trends away from hand labeling for, for, for training models, but yet I still see the incredibly important need for both validation and test sets uh, having ground truth. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, so unfortunately, we already reached uh, the time uh, that we, uh, we have to end this uh, webinar. Uh, so thank you very much, Matt, for a very interesting uh, webinar. I hope that uh, the uh, attendees also uh, liked it. Um, so from now on, every other week, we'll have on Thursday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific time, uh, a webinar like this. It's always going to be an expert, uh, either a physician, researcher, lawyer, investor, uh, who's going to talk for 15 minutes, and then we'll do a 10-minute Q&A. Uh, there are more questions, but unfortunately, we don't have time to, uh, to answer them um, right now. Um, next week, we'll have Hugh Harvey, who's going to talk about global regulations of AI. So that's going to be a very interesting session. I'm sorry, I said next week, but I mean in two weeks, of course, because it's going to be every other week. Um, so thank you very much, and uh, we'll stay in touch. Thank you so much. Yeah. And thanks, everybody, for attending.